Hi, I'm Mark Gibbs with The Great Outdoors and Nursery in Austin, Texas. And today, one of the little topics we're just gonna bump, we're gonna do a walk and talk and look at some fun things here. We're starting with the passion vine. I wanted to talk about the butterfly plant, the host plant situation, and then some great selections that are out there that you can mix in your garden, cover some different tiers. Uh, butterfly gardening is, is really cool. When you do a butterfly garden, um, you want to buffer the garden with higher plants toward the back that are gonna break the wind so the butterflies don't spend as much energy while they're going around and getting the nectar and laying their eggs. So evergreen plants that you could plant across the backside of a butterfly garden or taller evergreen or taller perennials that are gonna go to sleep in the winter but pop back up and give you some height to protect and buffer from that wind. Those are great ways to start a layout for a butterfly garden. And this is one of our specimen host plants right now. This is our native passion vine. You can see the amazing flower. Host plants are the absolute killer to have in a butterfly garden because they're gonna come to the plant, lay the eggs on the leaf. The worm is gonna pupate, come out, and start munching on the leaves. Uh, and then when it goes into the chrysalis, it'll come back out of the chrysalis as the butterfly and go right back to the flower. So you've created an environment that's 100% for the life cycle of the butterfly. Um, so don't worry, a lot of these host plants are used to getting munched up. They're very virulent return on growth. People come in and go, I need a plant, it's being eaten up. Well, it's the opposite of what we want to do. The plant is gonna return. It's strong enough, so don't get too worried. Um, we have a great, great little flitterary right here that's already got the worm. He's already come out. Um, he hasn't curled up yet, but he looks like he's getting close to going to chrysalis stage here. He's been munching away. He's nice and healthy. So we're going to expect this vine to go through a few cycles of getting eaten down, pop back out again, have the flower cycle, but we know it's sustaining itself. We're not going to have to do a lot of work to take care of that. So I do like to talk about the Society Garlic. This is a beautiful plant for our landscapes here. Um, again, good buffering for insect control, but then this flower is a nice, nice high stem, and it is a butterfly attractant. So this kind of makes a nice middle tier plant um, and really beautiful blooms. It does come in a variegated. If you want to have a little bit of foliar pop and contrast, you can interplant the variegated and get a really nice look. We're going to meander around and take a look at a few other really beautiful ones. We've got the Dark Knight Caryopteris. This is a stunning, stunning plant. Uh, they will come to this guy for the flower cycle. Uh, we've got some bees on there getting some nectar at the moment. And this is a pretty hefty little, little perennial in the landscape. I would typically use it as a middle tier or even a back tier. It's gonna get some really great size to it. And that blue color is just phenomenal. This should get fairly drought tolerant, just like the garlic will over time. So when you see that return on growth, you know you can start weaning it off some of that water a little bit. Now we're gonna sneak around and look at the gara. Gara comes in a couple of different flavors also. And they're, uh, it's a little bit loose of a plant for a lot of folks in the landscape. Uh, they do open up and kind of get this bowl sort of shape to them. That's very natural for the plant to do that. So don't think you have to come in and do a lot of maintenance. Uh, that's just itself kind of shading over those root systems as it's laying out and blooming. And again, we have a beautiful rose colored flowering one over here. Really, really stunning. Uh, these make a little whirl up the stem when they're blooming out. It's a really wonderful attractant, <clears throat> very, very xeric. And again, maybe mid-July, you could come in and do a little cleanup, give it a little bit more organization again. It'll usually have peaked out by then, and it's ready for a little cleanup, and it'll give you another great cycle flower-wise. Um, what else is beautiful in here? The yarrow is getting ready to kick in. The silver is stunning. This is a yellow flower on here. There are lots of varieties in the yarrow. Uh, this will make multiple crowns when it wakes up each spring. Um, and you can see this bloom comes up on a nice little tier. So again, kind of, uh, even though it's a super low foliage, you could use it as a border, uh, but typically I'd, I'd do it somewhere in the middle, even though some of that foliage is gonna be hidden in the summer because these, these flower cycles are gonna pop up nice and high. It does come in some greens and there's beautiful pinks, beautiful whites, beautiful reds, really, really a great bouquet. That's gonna be a stunning yellow on that guy. Then you get into all these phenomenal lantana. And the one thing I love to point out about lantana, if you've got two colors on the bloom, it's gonna be more of an upright plant. If you've got a single color on the flower, as in the purple trailing, 
or the white or the new gold yellow. If it's a single flower, it's gonna be more of a low blanket, okay? So you can use the lantanas as a bacteria in a butterfly garden to get some height and buffering from wind. And you can even use the single colors as your front border to, for a low, nice carpet. Um, we've got that beautiful white one that's going to be a really, really stunning upright. The leaves on the upright are a little bit larger also, so if you don't see the double color and you can't tell, take a look at the leaves. The leaves on the spreadings are typically much, much smaller and not quite as broad. But you can't go wrong with lantana. Uh, lantana are a little susceptible to thrips, which we just talked about a little bit ago. So you do want to watch for those in June or July. Uh, you'll see some crinkling to the leaf and you'll know you need to either start doing some cleanup and pruning, thinning out, or you need to start getting some spray on them to help uh, buffer them from the inset of the insects. Uh, we have the fragrant white mist flower. This is a shrub. This is the coolest. It puts on uh, a beautiful, almost an adjuratum looking blossom. It's white, it has a wonderful bouquet to it, and it'll be like a big snowball of a bush. And you go out and you touch it in the morning and poof, you'll have all these flitteraries just come flying off. It's just really cool, because you don't see them because all their wings are closed up. But when you get near the bush and you touch it, they just poof off like no tomorrow. Great, great bush. I have seen this stay evergreen in parts of Austin. Uh, other parts it will go down for the winter, but it is very, very drought tolerant. I had this in a little curb street side planting and it did phenomenal uh, the entire time it was in the landscape. Another great one back here is the, the roadside-y kind of blue mist, the, the uh, great roadside one that you'll see out on the bar ditches right now. This is getting ready to bloom out. Again, the white mist bush will have much of the same flower. Uh, beautiful, attractant for the butterflies. This guy can get pretty loose and kind of take over a substantial footprint. So you do want to give him some space. He does like to open up, he does like to spread, uh, but it's a heavy, heavy bloomer. Uh, has a slight bouquet, but the white definitely has a stronger bouquet. Uh, but this guy, you can begin to divide after a couple of seasons. You're gonna have nice crowns to it and you'll be able to separate them and move them apart pretty easy. So I had to show that guy. We're, I'm surprised we're not seeing more butterflies on these at the moment. Um, and then we're gonna kinda end up going over here by our butterfly table, which is of course gonna be the tropical milkweed. We've got a ton of the tropical milkweed right now. Uh, you're gonna expect to see aphids on these. Again, I was talking about plants earlier that may bring in and attract certain insects, which keeps them away from other guys. So the aphids are gonna hit these. Don't worry about it, it's just part of the life cycle. But this is a host plant. So the caterpillar is gonna eat the leaf. It's gonna go into chrysalis, come out as a butterfly and come back to the flower. So you've got a full life cycle. Really, really an awesome one for our landscape here. We have the native antelope horn, which is a fantastic species. A Little bit of a slow grower. Um, doesn't like a heavy soil. You'll see these all, all the way out to Lano, Burnet, Blanco, all over the roadsides. Rocky, rocky soil, very, very tough soils. So we don't need a rich, um, overly done soil for these guys. That, that'll push them into decline, strangely enough. So we do have some four inch available in these, but stunning, stunning host plant. And um, you'll see a full life cycle on, on the, the butterflies for these guys. We also had, uh, uh, a really beautiful variegated variety of the Asclepius earlier this season. Hopefully we'll find some more. Had a yellow stripe in the leaf and it was a pink bloomer. Really, really neat. Uh, they went pretty fast, but I'm sure we'll have some more coming around. So, and we do have all of the seeds uh, inside from Native American seed and from botanical interests on all the different types of milkweed and all the different types of butterfly plants. So you can get packages with those mixed or you can buy singles depending on your area and what kind of bouquet you wanna get going. We're gonna sneak over to Herbs and take a look at a few more fun ones over there and then we'll wrap up, we'll be right back.